our customers were saying, okay, I believe you that there's going to be a positive impact, but is it 0.2% or 2% or 10%? Because that's the difference between a no, a probably, and a heck yeah. Doing is so much more important than thinking. So for those who are on the fence, just jumping in and starting it is such an important first step. Hello and welcome to the Solar Maverick Podcast, where solar meets entrepreneurship and experience. I'm your host, Benoit Thanjan, so let's get into it. Hi, this is Benoit, your host of the Solar Maverick Podcast. I'm really excited to have on this episode, Paul Grana. He's a solar software leader and he's the general manager of Helioscope at Aurora Solar. I've actually now known Paul for maybe it's eight to 10 years when you were at, they didn't use RE Plus back that, then. then it was Solar Power Northeast in Boston in February, maybe eight or nine years ago when you were first demoing Helioscope. So Paul, I'm excited to have you on the podcast. We did uh, earlier this year, Empower 2023 with Tim Montague, and where we were talking about the investment tax credit and some of the new provisions of the IRA. Paul, welcome to the podcast. I'm glad to have you. Thanks, Benoit. It's great to be here. I'm excited because you're a thought leader in the industry. You've done some amazing work. I always enjoy having a conversation with you. It would be great if you could start off the podcast talking about Aurora Solar and your role at the company. Sure thing. So Aurora Solar is the leading cloud platform for selling and designing solar. We span both residential and commercial, and we've got market-leading products for both segments. On the residential side, that is what we call Aurora Solar, and on the commercial side, it is Helioscope. Our estimate is that we've supported over 12 gigawatts worth of solar being built and offsetting over 60 million tons of CO2, so the equivalent of 16-ish coal-fired power plants. But even behind that is supporting literally thousands of solar businesses in the US and internationally. And then my role at the company is general manager of Helioscope at Aurora Solar. So I am close to everything that happens for us on the CDNI side of the house. Definitely. That's a really great description of Aurora and the Helioscope product specifically. Can you talk about your background and what got you interested in solar and in software? Sure. My story started 2008, 2009-ish. At that time, that was before solar software was really a thing, but I started out with doing module level power electronics. You know, like in that time frame, there were about a dozen companies that had raised a Series A. So everyone had about $5 million in the bank and about $0 in revenue. And Phase and Solar Edge were two of the dozen, but like it definitely wasn't clear who would succeed, right, and make it to an IPO. So I worked for two other companies not named Enphase or Solar Edge, but it was a great spot to start because delivering a, something that novel, right, for the first time, telling people, hey, you can put this circuit board behind your solar module was a super complicated thing to deliver and value proposition to uncover. Obviously, there's a safety story. Obviously, there's a data story. Obviously, there's a design story. But there was also an energy story in terms of, hey, you're going to put these optimizers behind every module. It's going to give you more energy. But of course, our customers were saying, okay, I believe you that there's going to be a positive impact. But is it 0.2% or 2% or 10%? Because that's the difference between a no, a probably, and a heck yeah. And so, and I spent about four years doing that. And through that time, that's what actually led to Helioscope because we realized that there really wasn't anything in the world to calculate the impact of having an optimizer on a system. And so when we launched Helioscope, so we started the company in 2012, launched it commercially in 2014, we really thought of it as module level PV Syst. The interesting thing there from a like launching a company, et cetera, is our, all of our initial users were engineers. All of our beta users, all of our very initial customers when we launched. But then as soon as we launched, what we often found was our customers, the engineers, were saying, hey, this is good. Now that you're charging for it, I actually need six seats, one for me and five for my sales team. And what we realized is that while module level PV Syst and really like powerful simulation tools is cool for an engineer. The design aspect of what we did, because essentially part of Heliscope is this like cloud-based AutoCAD-like experience, but it's really easy to use. That was super valuable for the sales team or really the project development team, right? The team out there talking to building owners, homeowners, and landowners. And so we really realized that like, it's not a full pivot because it's not like we like completely changed the product, but we really shifted from first talking about module level physics that happens to be a design tool as well to, hey, this is a really powerful yet really easy to use design tool, gives you AutoCAD-like results, 
but doesn't require cat-like skills. Oh, and by the way, the physics is also super solid too. You're never going to like, you can trust the physics numbers, but you should buy it because it's such a powerful design tool. So that was the story of Helioscope circa 2014. Keep in mind in parallel, Aurora is also launching. You know, they launch, I actually don't know the Aurora dates, but like pretty soon thereafter, 2015, 2016. And Aurora was really pioneering the use of LiDAR and really, you know, particularly in the residential segment, saying that, you know what, we can automate high quality roof designs remotely and save you a roof visit, save you from having to deal with a change order. Because, you know, if you're not using Aurora, you're just taking your best guess, you're missing trees, you're missing, you know, material parts of a roof. And the problem there is you're going to miss the line expectations. You're going to tell the homeowner that this is going to be a seven kilowatt system with a five-year payback. And then after you walk the roof, it turns out it's a five kilowatt system with a seven year payback. And that suddenly, like the whole contract is up in the air and a percentage of those are going to cancel. So that was Aurora's kind of initial founding story and initial product market fit on the residential side. And so that was basically like both of us were off to the races up until about two and a half years ago when Aurora acquired Heliscope. And now we're all part of one company. Yeah, that is actually really interesting in how you broke down each of the software solutions and honestly to me like these software solutions have changed and made it a lot easier and economical to do solar like i've used both the aurora product and helioscope i mean you know obviously not having to go to do a site visit and getting accurate numbers through aurora instead of going to the residential customer's home just saves a lot of you know manpower and time obviously that's a huge expense related to the sales process and and for me, like being a non-engineer and learning how to use Helioscope, it wasn't really a learning process. What I loved and what you mentioned was that it's actually pretty simple for any user to really pick up. And I would always ask like the engineer to provide the PV drawing. But then once I got access to Helioscope, it was just interesting for me to look at because I was doing commercial industrial to just see the different options that you had using the product and then you know, looking at even carported systems, the type of panels or inverters that go or, or even at certain angles. So, I mean, I think like what Aurora has done is really innovative and I appreciate you explaining it. Can you talk about like how Helioscope, when you first obviously created the product and what you talked about has changed and what are some of like the newer features that you think people would be really interested that add a lot of value because we do have a lot of obviously developers and engineers who listen to the Solar Maverick podcast. Yeah, absolutely. So a couple of things I'd say there. The first actually, I mean, I already mentioned LiDAR is a big part of the Aurora story and we've incorporated LiDAR to, to Helioscope. And so it's also just a phenomenal way to get a lot of that benefit of a better design earlier in the process. Now, notice I'm not using the exact same language. We know with Aurora, you'll often hear like, you know, eliminate the truck roll and eliminate the roof visit. In commercial, you might still visit the roof. So it's sort of like, I'm not making the same exact claim word for word, but the point being, you can get to a much better level of accuracy earlier in the process, which there's still value in if there's some sort of fatal problem in the roof envelope or something near it, you want to find that out as early as possible, right? So, you know, it's definitely like a really valuable component, not to mention just not guessing on the pitch of a roof, right? LiDAR is great for telling you that. So um, things you like that. LiDAR, Paul, just so people are not familiar? Yeah, great question. So, LiDAR, I actually should know it's an acronym, which I don't know the details of what it is, but anyone who with access to the internet can Google it or chat GPT it. But basically, it's a point cloud, a set of points that is a 3D data set. So it allows you to take whatever building you're looking at. I'll just think of it this way. From a user's point of view, in a world without LiDAR, you're looking at essentially a two-dimensional tile, you actually call them tiles, of what that roof looks like from a satellite or from a plane. With LiDAR, you have a three-dimensional set of points and a surface that you project on top of those points for what that building looks like. So now instead of seeing that there is a tree, you've got the three-dimensional height and shape of the tree. Now, instead of seeing that there's a roof here and knowing that it's southwest facing, you know that it has this exact pitch at that southwest orientation. And so it's just a much higher quality data set to then either do the design by hand or automate that design. Yeah, that's a great explanation. I appreciate all you going into that. And that's amazing to hear that the Heloscope product has incorporated that in the software. And you're right, the earlier you could get to a more accurate drawing, it really helps the whole you know process moving forward. Yep. And it's actually a lot of time 
and man hours too. The other area that we've been working on in Heliscope, and then I'll give you an answer on the Aurora side too. The other area for Heliscope is we've invested a fair amount and continue to invest in our API capabilities. And the way I would talk about that is that there's an analogy that I've been starting to use a lot, which is that every solar company is really like a factory. If you were to sketch it out, sketch out a project lifecycle from start to finish, projects move through a process the same way inventory moves through a factory. And just like a factory, there are bottlenecks, there are redundancies, there's work in process, there's throughput and cycle time and all that stuff. And it's a powerful concept because it comes up in a bunch of different ways. But one of the ways that that comes up is we as a company, and this is where Aurora's on the Resi side have been doing this for a long time, and we're now rolling it out, doing more and more of it on the commercial side, is working with our customers to first of all, map out what their process is. Some customers know their process, they already have a schematic in Visio or something like that. Some customers don't have it sketched out, like they're doing it, but they might not have the diagrams behind what they're doing. So in that case, it's a kind of a mutual process to write it down on paper. Once you've got that though, it's incredibly powerful because then you can start to think through which steps are working, which steps are not. Should we change who is doing it? Should we change the order in which we're doing it? Should we automate a process between some of our software products? So super common is, you know, should we be automating data into, for example, Aurora or Heliscope or automating data back from Aurora or Heliscope back to your servers? And when I say it like that, it sounds really simple, but it's not because doing it well and doing it in a way that supports your process is important and hard. And we have a team of engineers that really fundamentally process engineers that work with our customers to do this. And so that theme of that kind of sales engineering and the APIs that can help our customers automate things is really powerful for driving, again, higher quality, fewer change orders and problems and or lower costs through that whole project lifecycle. So that's another area that we're doing more and more on the Helioscope side and really has been a strength of Aurora Solar for many years now. As a leading authority in the solar industry, life gets very busy. In addition to traveling the world as a speaker and for my entrepreneurial ventures, I'm a son, friend, investor, and entrepreneur. And when it comes to delivering a great sounding show for my listeners, I choose Podcast Laundry. All I have to do is record and send and the rest is done. They do the dirty work of podcasting for me. Yes, social media graphics, quotes, show notes, master editing, and much more. All I have to do is record. So if you're a busy podcaster like me with an engaged audience and want to free up your time to do more of what you love like going to the gym or spending time with loved ones go to podcastlaundry.com to schedule your consultation or call 347-871-8273 that's podcastlaundry.com or 347-871-8273 yeah that's really helpful to understand and i don't know if this is confidential or not but what do you see like in the future for how software is going to be optimized going forward. Obviously, people talk about AI. It would be curious to get your perspective where you see like enhancements or upgrades going forward, potentially. Yeah, it's a good segue to the other thing I was going to mention is on the Aurora side, on the residential side, we've been rolling out this product called Aurora AI, which actually, it kind of answers your question in actually two different ways. So first of all, let me back up and provide the context for Aurora AI. So Aurora AI is one of the AI products that we've got, where it gives our users the ability to request a roof and the system generates that roof really quickly. We're talking, depending on, of course, like, again, I just talked about process, right? So it depends on where you are in the process and what information you have and don't have. But generally speaking, you're looking at 15 seconds, amazingly fast. And so I'll talk about what that does for our customers in just a second, but back to the precursor to that because that's also another answer to your question. The precursor to that is that Aurora also has been supporting our customers with services for a long time. So someone in the audience might think of Aurora as a pure play software company. And in many ways, we are a pure play software company. We are a software first and foremost, but we also do have the ability to provide design services for our customers. So that if our customers don't have a team of internal users, like the most standard thing is we want to give you software so that our customers can use it from a browser. You know, that's our most vanilla and our, you know, we love for that to happen. But we definitely have customers who say, I don't have the team to do this. Can you actually do it for me? We have a solution for that as well. In those cases, we have now done the work ourselves 
because we've done the work, it's fair for us to be training our AI models on that. You know, going back to, I assume everyone is seeing ChatGPT today has lots of questions about what are you training your AI data on? Well, guess what? That is a valid question and it's an important question. And in the world of Aurora, we are in a great place, which is that we're not like freestyling with our users' data. We've got boatloads of data that we've generated ourselves in the service of our customers, but we've done the work ourselves. And so we can use that as the sort of feedstock for our AI algorithms. So I say that because first and foremost, one of the trends that we're seeing, and we're seeing this accelerate, not decelerate, is a blending of what does it mean to be a software provider, right? Are we providing just an application that people use? Or are we also providing services whether that is human driven or AI driven. So that's a trend that we're seeing because we're seeing just a lot of demand for that because part of it is that people are trying to expand quickly. They're trying to be ready for seasonality. Like if you've got a seasonal thing, like you can put that on us and not on yourselves, you know, not to mention if you're opening up in a new state, you know, it's a nice way to expand a geographic footprint of your operation using vendors and not your own employees. Again, when I say you, I'm talking about, you know, one of our customers, for example. So anyway, that's the AI. And then with that product in the market, now this comes to the second point of that AI product is also really powerful in the context of that workflow that I was talking about, in the context of your business as a factory. Well, when a design goes from being, I'm going to say 10 minutes by a human, and I don't know what, like for some people it might be five and for some people it might be 30. So 10 might be insultingly long and slow at the same time, depending on who's listening to me. But point being, when it goes from multiple minutes done by a human to 15 seconds done at the push of a button, it really does transform how you can run your business, right? There are so many different ways that people can and our customers do use that. So for example, for your inbound sales process, when a homeowner is calling, again, I'm using residential, you know, primarily in this moment, when a homeowner is calling, you're going to take their address. That's part of the standard process. Like that's like 101 name and address. At that point, you could have your inside sales team generate an Aurora AI design and have that be part of the initial feedback to the homeowner of, hey, this is preliminary. We have not visited on site, et cetera, et cetera. We haven't even looked at your utility bills, but here is a good estimate for what it's going to look like on your roof, what it's going to cost, and what the payback period or ROI or, or avoided cost, you know, post solar bill is going to look like. And so that kind of supercharging the homeowner's excitement at the moment that they're calling you, right? Like that moment is a pretty precious moment, right? So the more you can double down has some real value. Now, again, everyone's got a different process. And that anecdote may apply to some people and may absolutely not apply to other people, which goes to maybe the broader point, which is this software in general and AI in the context of software is not going to be one size fits all. And it's a good thing because the other way that we think about the world just on a five to 10 year horizon is we want our customers to not all become commodities and compete margin and who can race to the bottom. So part of how we think about the world is, you know, our customers have different reasons that they win. Some win because of like, you probably know this, whether like, I actually would love to hear your take on this. So like, I'm going to talk at a broad level, but like you being someone who's like in this, like, I'd love to hear your take. So some people are winning based on lowest cost, you know, and it's just a matter of submarining prices as fast as you can go. But others are way more consultative. Others are way more like white glove, you know, understand their customers, great customer turnaround time, things like that. So the point is, while someone outside the industry is kind of all the same, it really isn't for those of us who are in here doing this all day. And the final point before I wrap, and I'd love to turn the question back around to you, Benoit, is our software can be used by different people in different ways, ideally to get better at the variables that they're better at, whether it's fastest time, lowest cost, highest quality, whatever, right? So like, we want to support more differentiation, not less differentiation. It's kind of the bottom line that I'm getting to. Anyway, I'd love to hear how you think and thought about competition in the solar development game. Yeah, I mean, to me, I think it's more of a consultative approach. So that's why having more options and then to be able to provide a customer the solution as quickly as possible or different solutions is huge because it's interesting. If I think a couple of years ago, what you were talking about would take a while to provide and now you're talking about almost instantaneously and that's a very important point like with the customer you know they're excited they're excited to talk to you about it if you could show those options instantaneously it really makes a better customer experience and obviously hope 
hopefully make a better decision. And every customer I talk to brings a different perspective of what they want done. So obviously the more options that you could provide that makes sense, I think is really helpful to me. Like solar's even today, it's a large part of education and really like trying to find out what the customer really wants and what their preferences are. So you have to be open and flexible and there's no real, I feel like one size fits all. I don't think there is. So I think this is huge to have this sort of flexibility and AI, obviously taking data from, I can't imagine how much data you have and what the many uses you could use for that data. That was the thing that was coming up into my head. But yeah, I think that's huge that you offer it. And I think most good solar companies are in development. It's more of a consultative approach to the transaction than a one yep. side. I certainly agree with you in C and I particularly, right? Just because C and I, every job is so different. Whereas in Resi, we do see a little more variety, right? Like because Resi, you can do your best to make things cookie cutter. Like I've spoken to people that are like, we have two products. You know what it is? Two strings and three strings. That's it. You know, we'll sell you whatever it is, like, you know, eight kilowatts or 12 kilowatts or whatever the math ends up being on a per string basis. So yeah, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat in residential, but commercial, like you kind of need to be flexible, right? Just going to be so different. Oh, for sure. And that's a great point. Like residential, it's easier to come up with a more standard solution than a commercial. And then commercial, you're having like, you know, the director of facilities and the CFO, CEO, you know, engineering, there's just so many different people that you have to basically get their buy-in more flexible, the software solution and the better. So that's really interesting. Yep. Just out of my own curiosity, with all the data that Aurora has, is there, I would imagine you could see major trends that are happening within the industry based on that information. Is that something that Aurora looks into in that data or? We haven't, honestly. And part of it is that, I guess maybe I'd frame it this way. We see some trends in terms of our own customers' use of the product. So like to state the obvious, California is not a happy place right now. NEM3 is not the good news. We, of course, feel that. And so that's frankly like part of what happens. You know, somebody was asking me yesterday how things are looking for Aurora. And I was like, look, depending on your data source and how you ask the question, we're somewhere between 60 and 80% of the residential market. And Helioscope and commercial, again, depending on how you ask the question and how you do the math, somewhere between 80 to 90% of the market. So in both cases, if the market is having a rough year, then we're going to have a rough year, right? Like there's no getting around it because you know, like we depend on our customers growing. So at that level, we definitely are close to the pulse of the tides of the industry. The kind of stuff that we are not looking at at all are component choices, for example, right? So like bigger modules or vendor specific trends, that's just not part of what we look at at all. Like, honestly, it's legally, it's not really ours to do something with. There would be a whole, you know, can of worms. And frankly, like I almost refer people to, I don't know if you're familiar with Carta had this big issue where it had to do with secondary shares. They were violating their users' trust as they were trying to spin up a new market. And what I would say is like, we take our customers' trust seriously. And so that level of detail about what they're doing on our software is their property, not ours. And so there are certain things that we're not looking at because it would violate our customers' trust. That makes sense. And I appreciate you explaining that. And that's huge, obviously, privacy concerns that would happen from that. Yeah, I appreciate you explaining that. Just switching gears a little bit, Aurora has like an annual event called the Empower event, which is normally in August. Can you talk about that event and maybe last year's panel as well that you're involved in as a model? Yeah, that's right. By the way, we've got a couple of different events that are virtual. And I say that because I realize if somebody is interested in something like Empower, then they might also be interested in something like Sunrise. So both Empower and Sunrise, but they're different. Empower is industry events. So that is thought leadership. Think of that as the plenary panels at something like an RE plus or an interstellar where you're going to go and like look at the talks and like you hear people talk about the state of the industry, technology trends, things like that. So as you said, we've done this for a few years now. Last year, we were on a panel together talking about the impacts of the ITC and we are planning dates. So we don't have the dates set, but certainly people should keep an eye out for Empower because it will be coming later this year. And yeah. Like it'll be just another chance to talk about what's going on in the industry. And obviously like with such turmoil, like both, there are such big headwinds and tailwinds at the same time. It's like time for thought leadership for sure. Oh, for sure. It's basically a virtual event. Anyone could 
register it's free which is great because you have an amazing panel all throughout the day so it's just great because normally for these conferences they charge you know money for those conferences so it's great to have that thought leadership for free and then i don't know if there's also happy hours in certain cities after it so i went to the new york happy hour and it was interesting to bump into people who listen to our session that's see, really cool yeah so it is pretty cool that aurora does that and that's awesome is you know helping the industry with thought leadership and and especially now i was just thinking paul like the solar roller coaster just continues you know it does it definitely does and then i was gonna say i'm actually trying to look up the dates right now i should know but we are also planning a sunrise event which is Back to the, my analogy of like empower is like going to the panel discussions at RA plus or whatever. Sunrise is like going to the exhibit hall. Sunrise is also free, also virtual, where we have a bunch of different people in the Aurora product organization. Because again, we're now a pretty big company with a bunch of different teams working on a bunch of different stuff. And Sunrise is a place to look at what's new, what's going to be available, what should I be thinking about adopting, right? So again, the same way, the same mindset as you're walking through exhibit hall. That's another one. I know we've got one coming up in the spring. So that one's coming up sooner. I don't know the dates, but hopefully we can throw some, we can send a link along and put that in the show notes. Yeah, definitely happy to do that. And you know, if you definitely should check it out, those are two great events. You know, Paul, you're obviously the Solar Maverick podcast is about solar and entrepreneurship. Can you talk about maybe advice that you would give to entrepreneurs or people potentially looking to start their own company in the renewable energy space? Yeah, absolutely. So a couple of things. First and foremost, like step one is doing is so much more important than thinking. So for those who are on the fence, just jumping in and starting it is such an important first step. And then as you do that, the two things I would say are, first, you'll find that just by starting something, there's a gravity that is created. And I don't mean gravity as in like gravitas. I mean gravity, like the physics sense of like, you start to attract things. Often it's people are coming to you out of their own self-interest, but it's a win-win. And so if you don't have a thing, then there is no like gravitational force. But once you start a thing, like there is a gravitational force that exists. And then, you know, you're doing your best to maximize this. And by the way, I'm kind of answering, I'm cognizant that there's kind of two types of businesses here, right? There's the solar development entrepreneurship and there's the tech entrepreneurship, right? Because, and there's different levels of like getting something off the ground, but that really applies to both. And then the second piece of just getting something started is listening because, you know, if like step one is like, if it's the right thing to do, just get started. Like, don't wait to have all the details ironed out to just get going. And then the second thing is, again, listening. And I'll refer back to the story that I mentioned earlier, where we really thought that Helioscope was an engineering tool for engineers, like a physics tool for engineers, not a CAD tool for salespeople. And it was by listening to our customers and hearing where the excitement was, we changed our priorities, basically. Like, again, it was the same underlying product, but we had a roadmap. Like, the date that we launched, we had a roadmap of what we thought our next 10 features would be. And we basically did almost none of those 10 because there was a whole different set of 10 different things that when you're building for a salesperson who cares about the CAD features, well, suddenly that's our priority. And so, you know, the point being like listening is important and listening is tough only because you've got judgment about who do you listen to. Like that's the key. Fundamentally, that's like a product management type decision, right? Because, you know, once you get something into the world, you're going to start to hear a lot of opinions. And then the real judgment is going to be whose opinions are the ones that matter, whose opinions are the ones where there's a nugget of like real truth there. Who is the first of 10,000 and people more like them and who is the first they're kind of a yahoo and they're going to take you down this weird rabbit hole that won't help you at all that's the main thing and then the other thing that more so on the tech side but kind of applies on both is the most important thing to starting a company is kind of like proprietary access of a pain point in other words people think about startup as oh i had that idea as if like the product embodiment or the business plan was the important thing and it's about like, oh, I'm going to build an idea and I have this idea in my head. Here's the car. I have the schematics for the car. It's just a matter of like building it and launching it and like, cool. I would argue the important thing isn't the idea. The important thing is the pain. In other words, like when you're building, particularly in software, but applies to development as well, you're building for a set of people. And ideally, you're satisfying a problem that they have. And the thing that's, I think, the toughest, but also the most valuable when you can figure it out is knowing that there is a set of people right here that has a problem right here. And notice that like, if you know 
a set of people and a problem. And then you're going to start to build and you're going to listen to their feedback as you go. Like that process is what gets you to something successful, basically. And notice that like, as long as you have a good sense of like who you're building for, a real pain that you're building for, and like a commitment to like iterating, the exact product like is kind of secondary, right? Because the product's going to be changing over time anyway. So like, who cares? Whatever you think it is, it's going to be different a year from now. By the way, that's why when people, I do have a lot of conversations with people who are not in the solar industry, just one yesterday, you know, like coming from traditional tech, exited a company in traditional tech and is like, hey, I saw like solar is a big deal. Like, what can I do? And it's kind of like step one, you got to get close enough to have proprietary knowledge of the pain point that people have, you know, like you're not going to get that from reading industry reports, you know, like no offense to Bloomberg, you know, NEF or whatever. Right. So that's where those of us in the industry, which I think is most of your audience, like we actually know things we know things that should happen that aren't happening. And those are the like seeds of a business. Like the, the analogy that I like here is like a pearl is started from a grain of sand, right? That like glamour oyster, I actually forget whatever, doesn't like the grain of sand and it causes them problems and they create something valuable because of that grain of sand. Well, that's how I think the most powerful analogy to think about a startup. It's not about the pearl. It's about like the grain of sand. Like you need to find where there's a something that's causing someone so much pain that they're going to pay you for it. And then like, then there's a valuable business there, regardless of what the actual product looks like in the end. Oh, for sure. It's all about adding value, helping people with their pain points. And that's huge. Like you wouldn't really understand that unless you're within the industry. As you said, this has been an amazing interview, Paul. That was like great advice to entrepreneurs. And it was also too great to learn about Aurora Solar and the many interesting things you and the team are working on. If our audience wants to learn more about Aurora Solar, about yourself, what's the best way for them to do that? LinkedIn is probably best for both of us. I'm on LinkedIn. I only lurk on uh, Twitter, X, whatever. And so yeah, LinkedIn and pretty much for both of us too. And look, like Aurora's got, there's a bunch of ways to get in touch with Aurora. So, but like, we've got a great social team. So if you hit up Aurora on LinkedIn, you'll definitely hear back from us as well. And then Aurora is probably a better, more fully functioned Instagram, X, Twitter, whatever. But those are always the best ways. Yeah, definitely. And I'll also have that on the notes of the podcast as well. And thank you, Paul. This has been an amazing interview. I appreciate you making time out of your busy schedule. And it's really exciting, like the things that you're working on. And I'm curious to see what the next five to 10 years are going to hold for you. Well, that's the beauty of this industry, right? It's like for those of us who get the bug, it's hard to leave. So I'll be here for another decade for sure. And I'm going to put money that you will too. So looking forward to doing one of these in 2034. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully earlier than 2034. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Let's do that. Let's sure. promise that. Yep. All right. Thank you, Paul. Awesome. Take care, everybody. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Solar Maverick Podcast. The Solar Maverick Podcast is brought to you by Renew Energy. We're a solar development and consulting firm. If you believe that this podcast is adding value to you, please give us a five-star review and share with those that you think can benefit from this information. Please email all questions, suggestions, and feedback to info at renewenergy.com. That's I-N-F-O at R-E-N-E-U energy.com. The Solar Maverick podcast is produced by Podcast Laundry and executive produced by Benoit Thangin and Kevin Y. Brown. <laughs>